Uh, so we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this morning um, or uh, in other times, um, if you're joining us from, from outside of North America. Uh, we're gonna start today. Um, so we're presenting on Irsal Urdu, uh, examining multi-script Urdu discourse and the question of secularism for post-colonial digital humanities. Uh, I'm Max Johnson Dugan, and I'm coming from Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the, of the Lenape people. And I'm Elliot Mopelier. I'm presenting from Surrey, Canada. I work and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Across posts, conversations, and threads, the variability of online discourse in Urdu is expansive. Urdu appears with multiple transliterations for identical words, alongside Persio-Arabic script, English, and various emojis, hashtags, and other born digital elements. Take figure one, for example. It contains three sequential posts from Facebook that draw on and negotiate Islamic tradition in response to the recent Pakistani TV drama, Parizad. The first is written in Urdu and includes two emojis, a, fry, a fire emoji seeming to point to the fire of Jehennam or hell. The second is a mixture of Roman Urdu and English words which invoke God or Khuda to justify retribution. The final is the Arabic and Urdu pious expression, mashallah, which can be an expression of piety, a protective expression, especially to ward away the evil eye or nazar, and an exclamation of enjoyment. The messiness of these individual posts spread over large data sets inhibits text analysis in certain ways. So in this paper, we show how our project Irsal Urdu provides an open, relatively low tech and extensible application of Google Sheets for the analysis of Urdu discourse online. The core elements of Irsal Urdu is a tool that takes Urdu text in these diverse scripts and irregular transliterations in Roman Urdu and regularizes them into a single Urdu cor corpus for digital humanistic analysis. This paper describes the function of the tool as well as our project's theoretical moorings in critical digital humanities. In particular, the paper details the post-colonial DH stream from which it emerges and how critical secularism studies can expand the purview of critical DH to interrogate the entanglement of technology, colonialism, and secularism. We outline how this can advance digital humanistic work in Urdu and by extension on themes related to Pakistan, South Asia, and Urdu-speaking diasporas, where born digital texts are central to analysis. Furthermore, we describe how this contributes to post-colonial DH efforts by upending the centrality of Latin scripts, as well as decoding the secularism of technologies that undergird our network lives, including research, teaching, and learning. There we go. Having introduced a problem that faces DH analysis of born digital or du corpora, we want to pause to outline the remainder of the presentation quickly. First, we describe our research and the problems we encountered in our work that led us to develop Irsal Urdu. Then we discuss the tool's functionality, especially the word bank and transliteration components. Then we turn to the theoretical mooring of the project, namely how it emerged from post-colonial DH streams. We then discuss the place of Urdu and religious identity in DH technical in DH text, textual studies, excuse me, specifically the persisting intersection of language, technology, religion, and politics. And finally, we conclude with a discussion of what criti critical secular studies adds to this. Oops, Elliot, I read your feet, my bad. Uh, <laughs> the impetus for Irsal Urdu emerged during our respective work on social media corpora. My work engages Islamic materiality in the digital age, especially in North America and online, in order to understand the processes and factors that make things feel authentically Islamic. Elliot uses digital ethnography and the analysis of social media corpora to examine the interconnected role of TV and social media in shaping religiosity in Pakistani public culture. As two white male Muslim convert scholars who are non-native learners of Urdu, we have looked to critical DH scholarship for frameworks for subverting the racialization, coloniality, and patriarchy that persists in digital tools. We recognize the position we occupy, however, and know that future work on this project will necessitate both greater collaboration with South Asian colleagues as well as ongoing reflexive engagement with the colonial histories and current inequities that shape and empower our scholarship. So we're really good, briefly gonna talk about the functionality of this tool before moving on to the contribution of these wider debates. So first we described the tool because it was really through this, um, these, this, this problem that we were encountering in our work and our DH practice, um, this 
and then this lack of analysis of secularism in, in digital humanities scholarship that generated um, some of these theoretical conclusions that we described later on. So in presenting the components that make Ersal or do work, we want to draw your attention to the politics of language and religion that undergird the technical challenges that we encountered while developing this tool. Ersal Ordu includes three core components. First, it offers a guide for cleaning and maintaining messy aspects of a social media textual data set. Second, it offers an extensible word bank. Third, it provides a set of regularizing and transforming functions that take irregular Romanized data sets as an input and from them produce a regularized data set of text in Persian Arabic script as an output. We designed this tool to be easily modifiable per one's purposes and their corpus. So the word bank enables users to accommodate words that would not successfully be transformed using regular expressions or find and replace rules. Initially, we based these additions on our experience with transliteration practices in social media data sets that we were working with. As we worked and evaluated the success of transformations, we added additional high frequency ineffectively transformed words into the word bank. In total, we produced nearly 400 variant entries into the word bank. The word bank can grow as users submit other variants to us via GitHub, which is where this project um, currently lives. Turning to the regex transformer, the regex transformer is the central engine for normalizing corpora. A series of regex or regular expressions formulas produce an interme intermediary standard romanization, which can either be used for analysis on a standardized Roman or do corpus, or converted into the Persian Arabic script for comparison with a larger data set in that script. The transformer encompasses 14 unique regex expressions. The final formula in the sheet cross-references the word from the corpus and the word bank, and if it appears, it yields the word bank transformation, replacing the transformer's output. So lastly, the script converter produces an analog uh, word in the Perso Arabic script. The converter takes um, in the final list of words from the regex transformer sheet and uses a cipher to convert the intermediary Roman or the transliteration to the corresponding Perso Arabic letter in the lookup table. It then recompiles the world word. So overall, the converter um, produces results that were only about 65% accurate from the sample word selection from this corpus. And this percentage goes up as you sort of continue to add words into the word bank. So you can really kind of tell that this is e even with a lot of work and pretty extensive, um, you know, ciphers. Um, this is there, there's like tons of work that still needs to be done. And this is part of the problem in, in, in working with these sorts of data sets. So as you can see on this slide, we just took these two social media con comments about the same drama, Farizad, uh, and Irsal Urdu transformed into matching statements despite their very different orthography. And it yields the same error in both. So um, there's a word, Dukan, which uh, the converter is not really able to parse the short and long vowels. Um, and this is one of the inherent um, difficulties in, in, in doing these kinds of analyses, whether you're doing it in Google Sheets or you're doing a, a sort of really heavy lifting thing uh, in Python or something. Yersal Ordu emerges within a field of uh, right to left DH projects that disrupt the normalization of left to right languages in digital worlds. Post-colonial DH scholars like Rupika Rissam have compellingly illustrated how the centrality of English in code is part and parcel of colonialism and neocolonialism. We have learned immensely from projects that have tailored DH to RTL or right to left languages, regional aesthetics, and community formations. Some of the especially informative projects are on the slide, um, and the hyperlinks are there as well. I'll just quickly read the names. It's Qalb, uh, Avami Nastalik, Matansaz, Harmattan, and uh, also the RTL conference at the um, Digital Humanities Summer Institute. So in its practical form, Irsal Urdu primarily disrupts the neocolonial emphasis on English and the Eurocentric technological gaze. And our project's research objective is informed by the overlapping fields of critical Black DH and post-colonial DH that interrogate how race, colonialism, and neocolonialism uh, shape digital life. So for example, Safia Umoja Noble's critical Black DH draws directly on Irsal's post-colonial DH. And um, Noble advocates that we interrogate quote, the colonial remnants of digital media investments that are always bleeding into view through new neocolonial policies and discourses. From the outset, this project approaches the aforementioned marginalization of right to left languages as a neocolonial racialized process that technology mediates into digital life. Our contribution is to draw attention to secularism as another modality of power. Technology, religion, secularism, and colonialism have long intersected 
in Urdu speaking and writing. Historians have examined how religious scholars dealt with the advent of print technology vis-a-vis -vis their own scholarly authority, as well as the effects of the underlying print technologies on that, on that, um, that, that, that conflict, that negotiation. Beyond the religious sphere, Latin-centric technology development furthered the bureaucratic and intellectual subjugation of South Asian social affairs. This perceived incompatibility of persian arabic scripts with modernization can be found in other contexts as well, such as the Latinization of Turkish under Ataturk or of languages in the Malay-Indonesian linguistic continuum under British colonial rule. So in contemporary Pakistan, Zirak Ahmed has observed uh, the consistent, quote, belief that Urdu will always be unfit for modern technology, when the truth is that modern technology has never even wholeheartedly attempted to be a fit for Urdu. Urdu remains the dominant language for communication, including written correspondence, official business, and print media. Yet doubts about, the, doubts about the compatibility of Urdu and novel technology are evidence of the way that Urdu is marked as the inferior other. The adoption of multi, multiple scripts for popular use has been one avenue for the persistence of techno-historical power relations in the Urdu world. Irsal Urdu confronts two avenues by which neo-colonial relations persist in everyday communication by SMS and on social media. The phonetic use of Latin, folk transliteration and abbreviations and multiple script orthographies stems partially from a general non-availability non of Persian Arabic during the early years of digital communication. While major tech companies have worked to fill this gap with very incomplete success over the last decade, patterns of online engagement observed in our respective digital ethnographic work evidence a sustained adoption of Latin scripts by Urdu speaking users of social media and SMS. The post-colonial theorists and DH practitioners we've mentioned uh, earlier have also confronted some of these techno-historical power relations. So as scholars like Stephen Jones have shown, religion-oriented projects trace back to the very beginning of humanity's computing. Despite religion being a key component at these formative stages of DH, consideration of secularism as a driving force in the digital mediation of power uh, remains largely absent where um, Sethia Noble argues that critical race theory is the next logical step for post-colonial DH. We submit that critical secular studies offers an additional imperative, the interrogation of the processes which subordinated and continue to subordinate religious differences in order to solidify the sovereign power of the liberal na nation state. Just to very quickly note, uh, this line Alors, of analysis- is uh, Si vous regardez à cette petite Rather, critical secular studies analyzes the entanglement of secularism with the colonial. Same understanding. Secularism, Asad tells us, has become a hegemonic cluster of projects in the contemporary world. It permits and develops certain ways of being and living while disdaining, tacitly prohibiting, and stunting others. Critical secularism sheds light on things like surveillance and the suspension of rights of religious bodies, the encroachment of secular states on religious domains, and production of knowledge about Muslims. So returning to um, our figure one from, from our second slide, Ersal Urdu transformed these various orthographies of mashallah um, and, other, and these other kind of um, textual fragments from these posts into more revealing data about the cultivation and circulation of Islamic piety in Facebook groups. The resulting text analysis helped me track the way that pious social media engagement shaped wider cultural production on television. So these, all, all of these kind of, um, you know, multiple orthographies and kind of working with all of these um, in one data set, allowing me to sort of view these new feedback loops um, that reinforce particular social codes within these contexts. Religion is a thing that happens in the world that unfolds race, gender, and empire. Secularism occludes this unfolding by framing religion as either a private belief or an epiphenomenon of real factors. Feminist DH, critical Black DH, and post-colonial DH also alert us to the entanglement of these power asymmetries. Our DH practice with Ersal Urdu compelled us to integrate another frequently partitioned asymmetry, secularism and the de-emphasis of religion. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all.